Hello, we've been studying the Gospel of John. Today we're in chapter 12. Um, in this chapter we've been studying about how Jesus was being honored in various ways. And, and you can take a look at the previous teachings online to review these. It's just a fascinating study. And so this time we'll continue studying the as, as the Gospel writer John revisits some ancient prophecies that are honoring Jesus and pointing right to him. And how Jesus himself also uh, proclaimed honor that was due to him here as we finish out the chapter. Uh, Jesus is about to finish the mission that God gave him, and we touched on verse 36 last time, and we're going to pick it up from there. And so reading from the New King James Version, the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 36. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has, revealed, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw the glory and spoke of him. Verse 42, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come a, as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. So we'll conclude our reading at the end of the chapter. And uh, last time we spoke... <clears throat> the cover where Jesus spoke of his earthly ministry that was going to be ending soon. The time to respond to him, he said, was slipping away and that those who reject him are risking being left in darkness. And he concludes by saying in the first part of verse 36, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. Now, we talked about this last time. He reminded them they can become sons of light and avoid being overtaken by the darkness. Just as he told them way back at the beginning of his ministry in John 1, verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Jesus was constantly offering the incredible hope and the power that comes with belonging to the family of God, our, our creator God. As he finished his public speaking, we read in the remainder of, of verse 36, Jesus spoke these things and departed and was hidden from them. Now, the end of this verse kind of gives us a pause both in the timeline here and, and also a little bit of a pause for reflection in, in what Jesus had been doing here. We know there was a flurry of activity recorded by other gospel writers during this last week uh, up through this point. And I'd like to take just a moment to review the scriptures um, and, well, actually, I'm going to ask you to review the scriptures. Take a look at your Bible. When you get home, do it later. Uh, in Matthew and Mark and Luke, between the cleansing of the temple and the Last Supper. And we'll be starting into that Last Supper in the next chapter, next time. But to get a sense of these things, and the other accounts, uh, they record where Jesus was challenged in his authority to teach. He told the parable of the wicked tenants. It was really a thinly veiled reference to the religious establishment's hypocrisy. He also challenged and warned about self-righteous leaders or teachers. He let people know that he was not a challenge to Caesar, as some had thought he would be. 
He boiled down the, the entire law to two things, love God and love people. He shook up their belief system about who the Messiah really is and, and challenged what they believed, what they thought, because he quoted the Old Testament scriptures to them about that. He taught about the heart of giving to the Lord's work. He predicted the fall of Israel and the end times restoration of Israel. He talked extensively about the future and end times at the end of the age. He also asked, answered the Sadducees' questions about the afterlife that they had because they didn't really believe in it, but he kind of helped them understand how that worked. Whether they believed or not, that's another thing. He also spoke of his own second coming and eternal rewards that would be, be given at that time. He encouraged people to always be watching for him at that time. And we also see that he was betrayed by one of his closest followers, one of the twelve, Judas. So there are some very rich narratives that deserve your attention. So, so do please take a closer look at those scriptures after we're, after we're done here. And uh, understand that the Gospel of John is more focused on believing and unbelief and the results of those things. The rewards of the people that do believe and for those that don't believe in him, what happens to them. And let's take a look at the next verse, verse 37. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. He's talking about some of the people and some of the leaders. It says throughout, and, and throughout John, we've studied many activities and signs that Jesus did that really, honestly, they easily confirm uh, for anybody that has a <laughs> that's thinking and is not prejudiced against them, um, that they would believe, they would know that he was God's son, the Messiah, the one who came to save us. Yet many did not believe in him. And Jesus explained that this, excuse me, John explained that this was prophesied a very long time before that. He quoted Isaiah 53, as we read in the next verse, verse 37, I mean, verse 38, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now this shows that someone believes in Jesus. It's because God has revealed himself and his truth to them. It's interesting here. Jesus is also called the arm of the Lord. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, this tells me that, you know, the arm is an integral part. You know, this, this part of my body here, I'd, I'd have a really bad time without it. It's, it's part of the body. And it tells us that, uh, that God had a part of his body. Part of God was actually Jesus. Uh, the, the, your arms are generally what do the physical work with your body, your arms, your hands. And uh, I think it's just a wonderful picture that, that uh, the prophet gives us here when we understand that Jesus was the arm of the Lord being revealed through his many teachings and many signs. Now, after Jesus was gone, he sent us the Holy Spirit to teach us and to guide us. And then today we are the arms of the Lord, so to speak, the physical arms here doing the work of the Lord here on this planet. But we have to be willing to listen and to accept the things that he reveals to us. This verse by itself reminds the original readers of a very familiar passage of scripture. They heard it read every year in their synagogues. They didn't have their own scrolls and scriptures. It was not like, you know, they had a, a little pocket testament where they had all the scriptures in there. No, they had to go to the synagogues to hear the word of God read. And every year there, there's a passage that started in the middle of Isaiah 52, around verse 12, and it was talking about the one who would be sent by God, the anointed one, the promised one. Now, the Jewish scholars up through that time and far beyond always understood that that passage from Isaiah 52 in the middle of it all the way through uh, Isaiah 53, they understood that that was talking about the Messiah. Um, for hundreds of years after Jesus, they knew that was still talking about the Messiah. And it was, the interesting thing was, although it was read aloud in the synagogues to everybody, it was confusing a lot of people. And the reason why is, is they thought, you know, they, they clearly knew it was about the Messiah, but it spoke of things that didn't seem to match up with the picture that 
their own religious leaders there were teaching him. They were, during this time, they were talking about this king that would come, uh, you know, victorious over the Romans and overthrow them and set up a kingdom right there. And uh, that's not at all what this, what Isaiah 53 was talking about here. And in fact, I'm gonna read the whole chapter to you. And I want you to listen for three things as I read Isaiah 53. First, look for the rejection that Jesus would face then the suffering he would experience. And finally, the benefits and blessings that this whole process would bring. So Isaiah 53, starting at verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living, living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Wow. You know, we could teach for hours out of that, but, you know, this is what they heard, and they were trying to justify what they were hearing at the synagogue with what the, the other teaching that was going on. But, you know, I was reminded, I reminded you that this was part of the synagogue readings. Now, and it was part, it it's not there now. You can go and, and look it up now. The synagogue readings each week that they read, it's, it's not in there. They end at the middle of chapter 52, and then they skip over to chapter 54. Because sometime during the Dark Ages, hundreds of years after today's text, the belief in Jesus continued to spread throughout the world. And um, the, this, this passage just kind of disappeared sometime during that time from the synagogue readings. Now today, these scriptures are so plain and so easy to read by anyone who wants to read them uh, in, your, in your Bible, in a, in a scripture, online, on your phone, but you know, you'll understand them. But the religious establishment who continues to re reject Christ, they claim to be scholars of the Hebrew scriptures and the Jewish religion. They go to great lengths to say, oh, these aren't messianic. Well, their predecessors for centuries before them realized that it was, but now, you know, their mind is telling them, we must reject the guidance of the Holy Spirit because this couldn't be the Messiah because we don't believe it. It's kind of circular reasoning there. You know, this can't be the Messiah because we don't believe Jesus was the Messiah, and this matches Jesus exactly what he did and what happened, and so it couldn't work. And you know, it's just not a, it's a logical fallacy, not, not to mention the, the heart problem they have. And so we see the fulfillment of the scriptures continues as we read the next verses in John 12. Verse 39, it says, Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, 
He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Now, these verses are, seem a little difficult to hear and hard to explain. Uh, so I'm just going to skip them and move to the next verse. Verse 41, these things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. No, I'm not going to skip it. Actually, those three verses go together. But on the surface, does it make you wonder, is God talking about blinding people and hardening their hearts not to, and hardening them up so that they are not able to see and understand and receive his blessings and healing? I mean, this doesn't sound like the God that we've been studying here all these years. So let's dig in a little deeper. Are, what are we missing? Well, when we look at that, that passage of scripture, this was from Isaiah 6, um, it's actually a call about, I mean, about the call that Isaiah got when he was called by the Lord to be a prophet to give people God's message. So he was giving God's message to, get to his people, but God knew that a lot of people would intentionally choose not to believe. It was their choice. They would not fully trust in God. Maybe they thought they were good enough already. I, I know you don't know anybody like that, but that's called self-righteousness. It was a big issue among religious people back then, and uh, it continues to be a big issue among people today. Or it could be that they didn't walk, want to walk in the light, because we know the light of Christ shines brightly and exposes evil that people do. And the same thing, the law even more brightly exposed the evil and the, the shortness that we come, the how, how short we come of what God wants. And so sadly, when people turn from that light, they miss the healing, they miss the blessings, they miss the sight and uh, you know, the, the understanding that God wants to give them. So even as God is sending Isaiah out to people to preach to them, he's telling Isaiah, some people will turn away from the truth. They will harden their hearts. They will close their eyes. And the result of rejecting God's spirit, speaking his words through his prophets, is that God lets them stay blinded. He lets their hearts get harder and harder. He lets their understanding get dull. He lets them lose their minds, essentially, because their mind isn't working properly anymore. And he lets their souls and their bodies and their entire countries, in some cases, get sick. This is not what God wants, but, and, but God, is, see, God is not forcing these things on anybody. He is not making them be this way, but it's a re result of the rejection of the truth of God in their lives. They could have believed, they could have seen the truth and understood and be made whole, but they chose not to do so. Something else that's really interesting is researching this. I found the Hebrew wording for hardening their hearts in the prophecy uh, that was quoted here literally meant to cover your own understanding and conscious consciousness conscience excuse me conscience with fatness and calluses so that nothing else could get through so as as god speaking through isaiah isaiah proclaimed his glory man had actually built up their own defenses uh you know getting fatter and, and harder and more calloused and building things up to keep God's word from getting into their hearts, making it literally impossible for them to receive the truth being given. Again, is it God's fault that they couldn't believe? No. Was it Isaiah's fault for preaching God's truth to them? No. Each person has to respond to God's word. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So each person either receives the gift of eternal life by accepting the gift, as the Bible says, they receive the, or they receive the wages of sin, which is death or eternal separation from God. And friends, in this life, we may see the good gifts that Father God has provided for us. I mean, all you have to do is just look around for that. We also see, unfortunately, we see many of the evil things that Satan has brought, brought upon mankind as a result of him being cast out from God's presence, no longer uh, around God, no longer with God's influence on him. And, and it's been said that this lifetime is the worst time that believers will ever live throughout eternity. And for unbelievers, this lifetime is the best time they will ever have in eternity. And why is that? 
Well, that's because after this earthly life, believers will forever be in the presence of our Savior and never again experience the presence of evil that we see all around us every day. On the other side, except for a brief time standing before God as their judge, unbelievers will never again experience his presence, his blessings, his love, his goodness, and his mercy. Never again for all eternity. <laughs> what a choice. I mean, if you had to make a decision, what would you make? Follow Jesus. The good news for the people in our text today is that many of them made the choice to open their eyes, to soften their hearts, and to receive God's gifts that, that Jesus offered. Now, before I read these next verses, it's, it's positive and it's a little negative at the same time. So put yourself in the position of these people. Uh, try not to judge them too harshly because I, you know, I, I, I want to judge them, but I also can understand what, where they're coming from. doesn't excuse them. It's, okay? So verse 42, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So John reveals to us that there are many of the leaders here that actually did believe in Jesus, despite the fact that the supposedly more religious Pharisees and Sadducees on the council, council were still plotting to kill Jesus. And, and these new believers, they knew Jesus was the real thing. They didn't confess him openly and publicly about their faith. And we don't know exactly how many of these there are. Um, I'll touch on some numbers of these different groups here in just a moment. But some might call these new believers kind of shy and timid. Um, I think most of the people call them cowards. I mean, they just were afraid. And yes, it would be easily, easy for us to figuratively pick up a few stones and and throw out these closet Christians. I mean, on one hand, it was though it was a, a difficult position to be in. They knew of the secret plot to kill Jesus from the leaders of the synagogue. They didn't want to be part of those that were targeted. Hopefully they didn't agree with it. Yet the synagogues that were there, the temple, synagogues, it was the only game in town, so to speak. Um, they, didn't, they were a minority still, the, the believers. They couldn't just pick up and go to the other synagogue, you know, on the, down the street. It, it didn't happen there, you know. For the most part, there were multiple groups meeting in different places that have different belief systems, kind of like we have today. Uh, there is one exception to that. I'll mention that in a moment. But obviously, there were different beliefs. We studied in the last chapter about the conflicts between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Both groups had some strong points to their belief systems and both had major flaws to their belief systems as well. But yet somehow they managed to keep their, their belief systems um, under wraps enough that they kept enough peace that they continued working together in the Sanhedrin Council, which was kind of the, the ruling body that the, uh, the Romans kind of looked to, to to try to keep the peace among the Jewish people. Uh, these were 70 men. They were the top dogs in the country. Well, <laughs> that wasn't until God finally allowed Rome to wipe out what was left of the nation of Israel. You know, this was about a generation later after they'd rejected Jesus and, and continued to not, you know, embrace him. Um, they were gone. I mean, the, the nation was wiped out. Not one stone, like Jesus said, not one stone was left on top of another because of the destruction that was brought to them. Uh, after that, the Sadducees, which we don't know how many of those there were, but they pretty much ceased to exist, exist after that. Gone. We don't hear about them anymore. Even Nobody claims to be a Sadducee today. Uh, there was a remnant of the approximately 6,000 Pharisees that were out there. Um, that remnant ended up you know, getting together, becoming, uh, declaring themselves the official Jewish leaders throughout most of the 1900 years of the dispersion of Jews since then until they became a nation again in 1948. And, and then there's this third group. It was, it was the Essenes. I don't know, you don't read about that in the scripture. Um, they didn't play well with the others. <laughs> I'll just say it that way. Um, but, you know, it was this group, the Essenes, that 
we give credit to for storing some of the oldest copies of biblical manuscripts that we have today. They stored them in caves in, in Qumran near the Dead Sea. The, the Essenes actually had separated themselves from the other groups. They thought that these Pharisees and Sadducees, the entire Sanhedrin council had, had um, corrupted the temple and they were wanting to make sure things were pure. They had their own faults, but they'd gone out. They, they wanted to have no part of it. They were out in the desert in various areas throughout Israel, and the scrolls that they had of the Hebrew writings were stored there in these caves when the Romans were conquered them, and they weren't discovered until 1947, I believe it was the year. And so there were... It was, you know, God used these people, even though we don't even see them mentioned in the Bible. God used them to, to, to save and preserve the scriptures for us. And looking back, we see that these scriptures are essentially the same scriptures that we have in our Bibles today. Over 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years ago, these were, these were put in the cave and forgotten about. And uh, God brought them back up in these last days. Now, there were other Essenes. There were probably about 4,000 of them uh, throughout all of Israel and and really, it's kind of a fascinating study. Uh, you might want to look at it in your spare time. Uh, we know John the Baptist spent a lot of time out in the wilderness as he was coming up and studying the Word. Surely, he came across some of these purists that wanted uh, God's Word to be preserved. Also, we know Jesus spent a lot of time in the wilderness. So I'm sure he came across them. And I'm, I have no doubt that a, a lot of them probably embraced the teachings of Christ when he uh, came into their areas. But as a whole... They were, honestly, they were too isolated and they were too fragmented and, and scattered to really either accept or reject the Messiah that they were looking for. And they were very much looking for a Messiah. So kind of sad that they didn't seem to, to uh, embrace the, the Messiah when he came. But by far, none of these three groups we mentioned are the largest groups of God's people in, in that time. No, they, the largest groups weren't the politicians or the scholars or the religious leaders or the, you know, or, or the ones that separated themselves out for purity. No, it was the regular, everyday, common people that just wanted to live their lives peacefully. They wanted to work, they wanted to you know, love their families, and they wanted to know the truth of God. And there were billions of them. So, you know, those are the, most of the ones that were believing in Jesus. Now, I've kind of ran off on a rabbit trail about the different uh, groups there, but as a whole, the Jewish leadership strived to present at least a front of unity to the Roman occupation. Uh, they didn't want the Romans to use the divide and conquer strategy, and they feared that would destroy their nation. So these new believers in Christ kind of kept quiet and went along with the, the majority of the other ones uh, so that their nation wouldn't be destroyed. But you know what? Looking back now... It didn't work. You know, those who kept quiet, they loved the status quo and keeping their positions and hearing the praise of men, they ended up losing their nation completely. Along with their positions, probably many of them lost their lives at that point as well. Now, who knows how different the world would be today if they had just stood up for their beliefs. Kind of encourages us to stood up for your beliefs. And we'll never know because they didn't. But you know, God knew what would happen way ahead of time. He told people so many details in the Hebrew scriptures. Jesus told people what was going to happen to them just one generation ahead of them. And yet people still refused to believe. Quite sad. But you see, we still see that Jesus was honored in this passage by these scriptures that were given hundreds of years earlier that were directly applicable to what they were about to see in his life. Now, if you've been following the six ways that Jesus was being honored in this chapter, the next verses bring honor um, to Jesus through his own summary of his mission on earth that was almost complete. So this is the, the sixth way Jesus is honored in uh, John chapter 12. Verse 44, Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. I'm going to stop here. Now, these last seven verses are the last words recorded in John's gospel from Jesus to the public. And to be honest, I'm not sure that this specific message was given at this specific time and place following the earlier events in the, in the chapter. 
And you may ask, why would I say this? No, no, it's not because I'm a heretic. I'm not a heretic, okay? <laughs> but in every other passage that quotes Jesus, uh, the gospel writer John gives specific details. You look, the place it happens, who Jesus is speaking to, some, of the, you know, some sort of time frame, and, and then some interaction that happens during his talking or, or maybe follows that. And you see, in this passage, it doesn't happen here. So, you know, I was a little confused myself. So instead of just leaving it there, I, I dug in. I found some cool stuff. Uh, just like I've been doing for all of these studies, I dug deeper into the context. I looked at prior events and the following events, and I, I came up blank. I mean, we just read verse 36, right? It said, these things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from him. Okay, he's gone. Maybe the next verses give a hint in the next chapter. So I look there. No, they don't. Next time we're going to see him having the Last Supper with his disciples before his death. So I've got to keep digging. Maybe there's something in the words. So I looked and looked. I found people that know a lot more about these languages that, that the scripture was originally written in than I do. And in this case, it was the Greek. And the word used here is indeed kradzo. Don't know if I said that right. But kradzo, which is translated... In pretty well in every version as cried out or shouted to the crowds or shouted out. But the inflection and the tense in the Greek language here indicates that this was done persistent, a continual shouting of these words to the crowds. Okay, look in this passage of scripture though. There's not a crowd here that he's shouting to right now. Okay, you see... These are words that Jesus has used, and we've seen over and over saying these same things in many ways as we've studied the, his teachings in John. This passage actually reviews the things he said many times and in many places. It was a summary of his mission. It was a challenge to decide for him, against him, a warning to those who decided against him, and a promise to those who decided for him. John was giving his readers, and pretty much his Jewish contemporaries back then, and us today, a concise summary of the purpose of all the teachings that led up to this moment, to Jesus' hour, the time when it would all come together and fulfill his mission. It was at hand. So as we finish up this chapter, let's understand that this passage is the message, it's the heart of the gospel, in Jesus' words, being forever shouted out. As it had been so many times during Jesus' earthly ministry, John puts it all together for us here. In verse 44, Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that I should say what I should speak. Finally, verse 50, and I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Brothers and sisters, you'll be judged by what? By your response to the Word of God. Not by what you think are good works, maybe, or, or by any be religious beliefs that you may have, or maybe even the way that you think God ought to be doing things up there, or in heaven, or, or down here on earth. Those aren't the things that judge us. Not even your church's view of the Bible. What does Jesus say? He says you'll be judged by the words of God that he speaks. Remember, Jesus didn't come to judge and condemn us. He didn't have to come as a man to do what his deity, his purity, his holiness, his deity demands to be done. Okay? He did need, though, to come. He did need to come to rescue us from our own sins, from mankind's self-inflicted circumstances and condemnation. Okay? Do you get it? That's why he came. And it all comes down 
to one choice. It's your choice, your choice. Every day, believe in Jesus and follow his words or reject Jesus. And he's laid out the results. It's your choice. Choose wisely. Every day, I want to encourage you to be the light. Be sons of the light. Follow Jesus.